London has seen its fair share of white elephant projects in the past, such as the Millennium Dome in the 2000s and the Emirates Cable Car in 2012. The Shard at one point was also considered a white elephant, even as far back as the 1800s after the construction of Tower Bridge. Many people at the time saw it as useless, that the bridge looked aged and unmodernised. However, the Millennium Dome, Tower Bridge and the Shard are now seen as instantly recognisable London landmarks and are considered anything but white elephants. Apart from the Emirates cable car, that's still a white elephant. But on the 26th of May 2010, after the construction of Stratford International, East London's newest railway station, London Assembly member Andrew Boff described the station as a quote, complete white elephant, with over 210 million pounds of taxpayers' money used to construct the station. But why did he say it was a white elephant? Well, the whole intention of constructing Stratford International was to welcome international rail services, hence the name. However, the station since its opening in 2009 has never seen an international service call at the station, with current international services continuing to bypass the station. So, what happened and how is it that we got to this point now? Well, join me as we take a deep dive into the workings and failings of Stratford International, from its initial opening to its current state as an international list station and its potential in the future. Welcome to Runderground. So Stratford International Station opened in November of 2009 with its services operated by a sub-brand of Southeastern known as Southeastern High Speed. They used a special Class 395 trains to operate on the high speed network and due to the nature of their speed they were coined as the Javelin trains because Olympics. And in fact, some of these javelin trains were named after fast British athletes, for example, Dame Kelly Holmes because Olympics. But did you know that the construction of Stratford International Station was actually completed three years prior to services operating in and out of the station? But before we get into that, let's talk about the construction of the railway itself. Because Olympics. The station itself lies on a high-speed railway, officially called the Channel Tunnel Rail Link, otherwise known as High Speed 1, or HS1, between St Pancras and the Channel Tunnel, as well as South Eastern High Speed, another rail operator that uses HS1 is Eurostar, serving destinations such as Paris, Brussels and Amsterdam. Prior to the creation of HS1, Eurostar services used the high speed lines in France to the Channel Tunnel before using the much slower lines in the southeast. For more on Eurostar in a moment. So High Speed 1 was opened in two sections. The first was in 2003 between the Channel Tunnel and Forkham Junction near Gravesend. Then the second section opened in 2007 between the newly built Ebbsfleet International and St Pancras International stations. A brand new Eurostar depot close to Stratford was also constructed. So in 1994, when Eurostar services were first established, once the train had entered the UK using the Channel Tunnel, it had utilised the local South Eastern Network. Then, in 2003, when the first section of High Speed 1 opened, Eurostar services utilised the high speed track up to Farkham Junction, where there was a spur of track that, yet again, connected with the South Eastern Network. Finally, in 2007, when the full length of HS1 opened and station developments were complete, particularly at St Pancras International, Eurostar services could officially terminate at St Pancras International, rendering the former terminus at London Waterloo useless. Now you might be wondering when the Eurostar trains used to operate along the South Eastern Railway network, how was it that it even got its power? I mean the train uses overhead wires, right? Well it's because during that time Eurostar trains were fitted with both a pantograph so the train could obviously connect the overhead wires, but also it had third rail shoes used because for the South Eastern Network uses a third rail to power their trains. Once HS1 was completed in its entirety, all of the third rail shoes were removed from the Eurostar fleet. All right, so we covered some basic background of High Speed 1, Eurostar and South Eastern High Speed. So what has that got to do with Stratford International? Well, did you know that that station wasn't even meant to exist. So, what happened there? Well, let's see. What major sports event happened in 2012? 
Hmm. Can't quite think what that was. The International Olympic Committee has the honor of announcing that the Games of the 30th Olympiad in 2012 are awarded to the city of London. We've done it! London have won it! Time Helen Glover and Heather Stanley become Team GB's first gold medal. Another successful day for the British team. was the global stage to the Summer Olympic Games in 2012, arguably the biggest sporting event in the world. Its games are focused mainly in East London, with sports such as sailing and cross-country mountain biking taking place elsewhere around the UK. But anyway, let's take a brief look into how the Olympics in London came to fruition. Every two years, the Olympics host an International Olympic Committee session to announce the next nation to host the Olympics. The process starts seven years prior to the commencement of the Games, when the city is interested in hosting the Olympics picks put forward their bids. So, what are some of the requirements of hosting the Olympic Games? What's involved in a city's bid to host? Prior to the committee's vote, approved host cities' bids are put through a rigorous audit for around 10 months. Things in the audit include the ability to accommodate a large number of not just tourists, but journalists, athletes, and their support crew. There also needs to be available accommodation, such as hotels and temporary housing, ample security for participating athletes, suitable venues for the relevant games, and of course, transport infrastructure. When a city has passed the audit, it's then considered a candidate city, which then transitions to the second stage of vetting. During this stage, a candidate city pays a non-refundable acceptance fee of $150,000 to the IOC. Then, when the winning bid is announced, works get underway immediately to implement the necessary infrastructure to host the Olympic Games. Why is it that cities go through so much hassle to put their bid forward to host the Olympic Games? even if it makes them borderline bankrupt? Well, there's a variety of reasons. Hosting the Olympic Games is such a huge accolade and there's a massive sense of pride that is created across the nation. Secondly, there's a huge socio-economic opportunity when a city hosts the Olympic Games. For example, creating tourism to the area as well as creating jobs for local people across many different industries. However, the most important reason for a city to host the Olympics was what happened afterwards, regeneration of key opportunity areas. So when London had submitted their bid to host the Olympics, included within their audit was a number of key opportunity areas. The most important one was East London, in particular, Stratford. In an article released by International Quarter London, they stated, Pre-Olympics, Stratford was viewed as being too far east to be considered a viable home for most businesses who operated from central London, in spite of it having a higher population density and higher unemployment than other locales in London. Stratford was named as home of the Olympic Village and Stadiums due to the potential of the area, the historic canals, the potential for fast and effective transport from the city centre. It was well placed in many regards, and after the Olympic bid was won, the upward trajectory of investment in the area began. Hosting the Olympic Village in East London was a strategic decision into the unlocking and investment of the area. The intention was to make Stratford the capital of East London, with current developments taking place in a project known as Stratford City. Because prior to developments, in particular the land that encompasses the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, prior to that, all of that area was former railway land. With an international focus on East London, there needed to be an international appeal, as well as the necessary transport infrastructure as what was mentioned in the audit. So, HS1 was being constructed nearby. Let's build a brand new international station. The construction of Stratford International Station was well underway, and it was all built with an international expectation, with domestic and international platforms, an area for check-in, border control, and even down to the commercial units that offered car hire, for example, which actually still operates today. But there's one problem. Eurostar, the only international rail service to operate within the UK, didn't want to stop at Stratford International. Well, shit.
Eurostar had numerous reasons to not stop at Stratford International. For example, they claimed that transport from the station was inadequate at the time. Passenger interchange between Stratford International and Stratford Regional Stations was also non-existent. Not even the extension of the Docklands Light Railway in 2011 to its own Stratford International Station was enough for Eurostar. It was anticipated that Eurostar would stop at Stratford during the Olympics. However, during that time, Southeastern High Speed had increased the number of services between Stratford and Ebb's fleet up to 12 of their javelin trains an hour. Even the international platforms at Stratford were modified to accommodate domestic services since the international platforms were built to specifically accommodate the lower Eurostar trains. <laughs> and in fact, there was one time I was using Stratford International, there was a Eurostar train that was headed towards St Pancras that pulled into the international platform but it wasn't to offload passengers or anything but it was to allow a service that was stuck behind theirs to pass so maybe Stratford International is one of the most expensive passing loops out there however the strongest case Eurostar had to not stop at Stratford International was this the journey time the total journey time between Stratford International and St Pancras is a grand total of seven minutes that's it. Seven minutes. <laughs> it's actually something Southeastern High Speed continues to use as part of its marketing. So for such a short journey time, Eurostar couldn't justify stopping at Stratford International Station. Not only would it make overall journey times longer, but it would also not make it economically viable. Which I mean, seven minutes, I mean, God, I wish I could run that distance in seven minutes. <laughs> In fact, as a quick start update, 9.1 kilometres have elapsed and I have 2.24 k's remaining. So Eurostar made it clear that they weren't going to stop at Stratford International Station. Well, yes and no, because Eurostar had other plans introducing Eurostar Regional. Eurostar Regional was a planned service to have their Eurostar services call at UK cities across the UK. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> its trains were planned to use the West Coast and East Coast main lines calling at cities like Birmingham, Manchester, York, Darlington, Newcastle, Edinburgh and I think even as far as Glasgow. Even a pamphlet was created by Eurostar indicating their intentions to create their Eurostar regional services and that's when you knew that it was serious but a pamphlet was made. And it wasn't even something Eurostar was just doing for the bants. They were fully serious about it. They even had some trains that were custom made. They had some 373s uh, that were made to operate on the West Coast and East Coast main lines. And at one point, some of these trains were leased to GNER at the time, where they operated services on the East Coast main line. And even if that wasn't enough, a fully fledged Eurostar facility was created close to Manchester Piccadilly Station. It was Manchester International Depot, I think it was, um, that was going to be used to service Eurostar trains in the area. And things looked even more promising when there was a proposed cord to connect HS1 to HS2. And yet, all of these plans didn't happen. The high-speed cord was shelved, modified trains were now used on regional services in France, the Manchester International Depot, with all of its Eurostar brands in, mostly just sat there until it was utilised by a different train manufacturer. It was yet another blow, not just to the railways, but to poor old Stratford International Station. However, it's worth noting that the plans haven't completely died since Eurostar still own some track rights on the West Coast and East Coast main lines. Looking at how it is right now, as well as the tough competition, particularly against low-cost budget airlines, it's just not feasible. And the planned Eurostar regional services never happened. What now? I mean, you have an international station that's just sat there, that's not been properly utilised with a station name that doesn't even make sense. Why is it even called Stratford International if there are no international services that call there? It just doesn't make any sense. And the fact that with the real services, there should be more international appeal to the area because there's the historic Olympics that have happened in the past. And the fact that with low cost air travel just makes it all the more appealing to use that, to fly to destinations rather than using clean and green rail travel. It's just an absolute mess. It just doesn't make any sense. It makes no sense. <sighs> so where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? 
Eurostar's failed plans were nothing but disappointing, and Stratford International continues to remain to live up to its expectation. It's something even the London Overground still holds on to to this day. <laughs> Take a listen the next time you travel from Hackney Wick to Stratford. The next station is Stratford, our final stop. However, Eurostar wasn't the only disappointment to happen to East London. Another failed anticipated service was from German rail operator Deutsche Bahn to operate London to Frankfurt services, even going as far to preview their trains at St Pancras International Station. But in 2018, their plans were shelved due to a change in economic circumstances. Then there were the planned European sleeper services known as Nightstar. This is this is basically the dark mode of Eurostar Regional. You had trains from different cities in Europe travel to different cities in the UK. But instead of having modified trains like Eurostar Regional, Nightstar had specially built coaches for the project. However, that project was also shelved for a number of reasons, such as rising costs, a change of passenger habits, and competition to budget airlines. But in spite of the steps backwards, all may not be lost, as hope for Stratford International maybe on the horizon. Until as recently as late 2021, Spanish rail carrier Renfe had set plans forward to compete with Eurostar and the London to Paris route, with a Renfe spokesperson stating, At the moment, there are available paths and capacity to operate the high-speed line. This high-speed route was of high traffic and was growing until COVID-19, a trend that is expected to recover next year. According to the demand analysis carried out, it will be viable and profitable for Renfe to compete with Eurostar. However, it's not known as of yet whether their services will call at Stratford International or other stations along the route, at least not at the time this video was published. It is worth noting that transport ministers and politicians like Andrew Boff had also petitioned that any rail companies using HS1 as part of their rail agreement must call at Stratford International as a measure to utilise the international aspect of the station. But there's one thing for certain, only time will tell. If the Olympics were anything to go by, Stratford proved the case that if you make an investment into an area, opportunity will come. Stratford was often dismissed as an opportunity area. It had one of the most deprived communities in the country, unemployment was high, and levels of health were poor. But now, post-Olympics, Stratford and surrounding areas like Hackney Wick, for example, are thriving. There's job prosperity, housing developments are popping up left, right and centre, <laughs> one of which has actually taken place on the taxi rank at Stratford International Station. And its strong transport connections to the city, Kent and East Anglia continue to be at its forefront. It's also emerging as a cultural entertainment epicentre, with the recent controversial announcement of the 21 and a half thousand capacity music and entertainment venue known as the Madison Square Garden Sphere, which is quite surprising considering the precedent Stratford set for its sustainability, in particular to the Olympic Games, going as far as to create temporary venues. However, Stratford also continues to be a case study for its focus on sustainability and urban regeneration. But Stratford has everything going for it, but the missing piece of its puzzle now is the forever anticipated international rail service at its international rail station. Because if the current developments are anything to go by, I believe it's not a matter of if there are international rail services, but it's a matter of when. And Stratford International's curse as London's biggest white elephant is no more. 11.54 kilometres later, we've made it to St Pancras International, easily one of the best terminuses in London. It just feels so grand just looking at the halls. It is a beautiful, beautiful station and a sentiment that is often shared with travellers and Londoners alike. In case you've noticed with my route in today, I had actually followed somewhat a similar route of the HS1 tunnels between St Pancras and Stratford International. But did you know that HS1 wasn't actually planned to be in a tunnel? That is right, it was actually meant to run alongside the North London line. However, due to complaints from the local people and communities, it was decided to place High Speed 1 into a tunnel. Even given the current circumstances with the climate crisis that's happening, I think it's important more than ever to make rail travel appealing and affordable. But I hope that maybe one day we'll see Stratford International truly utilised for the international station that it was always intended to be.